That is the beauty and the joy and the power of daily prayer. Daily time spent with Jesus. When we intentionally spend time with the Lord in prayer every single day, particularly in the morning, it will set the tone for your whole day. Well, friends, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to share with you really the the joy of my heart and the passion of my life, which is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think it's it's good news, right? And it's good news that we don't often hear about. So I'm, I'm just so pleased to be able to share my heart, uh, my story, and the good news of the scriptures with you. You know, it was um, a few years ago, I was at an Ash Wednesday Mass, and I had come into that Lent uh, with a plan. I knew I needed to give up gossip, okay? And, and this is a noble pursuit, right? I thought, surely God wants me to give up gossip to root this sin out of my life, right? But as I sat in mass, this very holy, um, zealous young priest asked us to instead of bring our plans into Lent, to ask the Lord what he thought we should do for Lent. So after I received communion, I went to my pew and I knelt down and I just told the Lord in my heart, you know, God, I'm sure you want me to give up gossip and I'm working on it, God. I'm going to do it, Lord. But if there's anything else you want me to talk about or anything else you want me to work on, uh, I'm here. I'm listening. And in a gentle voice, I heard in my heart the Lord say, spend time with me every day. And I thought, really? That's it? (laughs) I thought Lent was about penance and uh, punishment. I I had this this view of Lent as a time to work, right? To to root out my sin and to perform better for God. It's a totally backwards view of the season of Lent, but I didn't know that at the time. So the Lord gently invited me to spend time with him every day. Now notice, he didn't say pray every day, because I'll tell you what, I did pray every day. I had a prayer life and a good one at that point. I spent time in prayer at some point in some way with God every single day. I was working in full-time ministry, but the way in which God invited me, spend time with me every day, it was so different. It was uh, so tender and invitational that I began to look forward to those times spent with God in prayer every day. And I began to prioritize them, to start my day by spending time with the Lord instead of just fitting prayer in when I could and kind of going about my normal routine. I began to instead start my day with prayer. And I remember one such morning, I was spending time with the Lord. It had started small, just a few minutes, and then I enjoyed it so much. It went from five minutes to 10 minutes. Then the next day it was 15 minutes and on and on until finally I'm late for work at this point. I'm enjoying this time with the Lord so, so much. And on one of those mornings of of spending time with God, I told him about uh, the desire of my heart for community, for vocation, for friendship. I was still in a relatively new city and I didn't have any family nearby. So I just related to the Lord. I told him, I feel like I don't belong anywhere. And that was a unique word for me. So I even journaled it. I feel like I don't belong, God. And I felt God's presence. I was so comforted by the peace of his presence, but he didn't swoop in with any platitudes. He didn't fix anything. It's not like a community suddenly walked through the door and answered my prayer on the spot, right? I just simply connected with the heart of God by sharing my heart with Jesus. So I went about my morning, I got ready for work, I got in the car, and when I plugged in my phone, I put it on shuffle, the whole library. Take your pick, Lord. (laughs) I put it on shuffle and caught myself singing along to the very first song that came on, and it was an oldie. This is how old this story is. Uh, Taylor Swift's first album, maybe second album, had just come out. And so I'm driving to work and I catch myself singing along to this very catchy chorus. 
If you could see that I'm the one who understands you. Been here all along, so why can't you see? You belong with me. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with my terrible singing, but it, it, it was so powerful. It was so sweet. It was so personal. Even telling you this story that I, I tell a lot because it changed my life. That experience, that encounter with Jesus, it changed my life that he would come and that he would speak to me in such a unique and personal, such a fun way. He used that word belong. He heard my heart and he wanted to console me in the reality that I I can find love and belonging in, in all of these human relationships, but that ultimately I do already belong to the Lord. I already belong with him. It, it confirmed so many things for me that I was loved, that he was present, that he heard me. Now, let me, let me um, dissect that experience for you just a little bit. I believe that even if I hadn't prayed that morning, even if I hadn't written that word belong in my journal, even if I hadn't related my heart to God, I probably still would have gotten in the car and heard that Taylor Swift song, but I would have missed a connection with Jesus. I would have missed his heart appealing to my heart for relationship. I would have missed that consolation. That is the beauty and the joy and the power of daily prayer daily time spent with Jesus. When we intentionally spend time with the Lord in prayer every single day, particularly in the morning, it will set the tone for your whole day. If you desire to see more of God's activity in your everyday life, spend time with God every day. Because the graces of that time spent with him, those words, those memories, those consolations, they will bleed out and touch every moment of your everyday life. If you want more of God, spend time with him intentionally every single day. Because Jesus is a real person, right? So we have to spend time with people if we want to grow in relationship with them. That's how we grow intimacy in even our human relationships. Sometimes there's a disconnect there and we don't tend to understand that the same way we build relationship with God, that's the way that we build relationship with people, right? Through spending time with him. Friend, I want to uh, affirm, I want to remind you that God is real, that he's alive, that he's living and active right now. He's already speaking to you. He's already moving in your life right now. Even if you're coming into this conference, this experience thinking, I, I don't know God. I don't know how I feel about God. He knows you. He wants relationship with you. He already loves you. He chose you to be here right now, to listen to these words, to be invited into daily relationship with him. Uh, the catechism in paragraph 27 is one of my absolute favorites. And I want to kind of um, set the framework for this conversation with paragraph 27. The desire for God is written in the human heart. Because man is created by God and for God. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and happiness that he never stops searching for. Isn't that incredible? God has written this desire on your heart, not because it, it won't be met in him, not because you're meant to just walk around with this longing, with these unsatisfied desires. No, he writes this desire on our heart because it reflects a desire of his heart. He wants intimate, personal, dynamic, that means two-way relationship with you. He doesn't only want our prayer and our devotion. He doesn't want distance. He wants union. He wants our hearts to be grafted together. Think of Jesus uh, speaking about the vine and the branches. That's how intimately connected he wants to be to us. He wants to be our source, our life, our sustenance, our happiness, our joy. Only in God will man find the truth and happiness that he never stops searching for. So our faith, right? Our showing up to daily prayer 
is simply a response to God's relentless pursuit of our hearts. I know sometimes prayer can feel like work, right? It's one more thing to do. But what I want to discover this morning is a way for prayer to go from obligation or duty to joy, to satisfaction, to love, to intimacy, from obligation to joy. And that can only happen because God is exceedingly personal, exceedingly personal. Jesus came, God became flesh to show us how invested, how committed, how loving, how good he truly was. The passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is miraculously and mysteriously for all of humanity and for you, you individually. He came, he was born in a stable for you. He, he preached the good news. He promised the Holy Spirit for you. He suffered and died on a cross for you. Somehow in God's generous, gracious plan, it was for all of humanity for all time. But I want you to understand that that God's activity, God's energy, God's uh, impulse, his motivation is for you. He wants relationship with you. This is not a one-sided pursuit that we have to strive to grow in holiness. We've got to root out sin and grow in virtue. These are noble efforts, right? But they cannot be accomplished apart from the vine. We are only the branches. We cannot live a life of holiness, a life of virtue, a life of love. We cannot live the life we desire to live without intimate, personal, dynamic relationship with Jesus. And that happens in daily prayer. I want to um, just, if you don't believe me, I want to give you some uh, scriptural evidence for just how personal Jesus is. And, and write these chapters down because I want you to spend some time later with them to even enter into them imaginatively to be that woman that I'm going to share about, uh, to experience the gaze of Jesus, to hear his words spoken to you, not just to the woman with the hemorrhages, not just to the woman at the well, but to hear Jesus speaking to you. So without further ado, the woman with the hemorrhages, you can find her in Mark chapter five. You're probably familiar with the story. This woman has suffered for years, over a decade, right? She's exhausted all of her financial resources. She's discouraged. She's disappointed. She hasn't been able to find any relief. I think we can all relate in some way to her desperation. And yet, she has hope. She has the hope that if she can only touch the hem of his garment, right, that she would be healed. So she makes her way through the crowd. She reaches out. And the moment she touches that hem of his garment, she's healed. Jesus did what he promised to do as the Messiah. He came to heal, to restore. And that woman was totally healed and restored the moment she touched the hem of his garment. But that wasn't enough for Jesus. No, no. He, he needed to know who she was. He needed to see her face, to hear her voice, to, to hear her story. He wanted to encounter her. It's not enough that he gives healing. It's not enough that he gives mercy or forgiveness. He's not here only to, to give these benefits that come through simply who he is by virtue of, of who he is as Savior, as Messiah, as Lord. No, he wants encounter. He wants to see her face, and Jesus wants to see your face. He wants to hear your story. He wants to encounter you. The woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. I love this story because she is dragged before Jesus, uh, just drenched in shame, right? She's being actually accused by these men who have dragged her out of the bed of her lover, brought her before Jesus. You can imagine, you can imagine the shame that she felt, how it both felt the, the hatred that she was feeling, even physically, viscerally around her. And so what does Jesus do? When they come to Jesus and they ask him to accuse her, they ask her, him to judge her, to punish her, to sentence her to death. Jesus, 
gets down on the ground and he begins to write in the dirt. It's totally unexpected, isn't it? Jesus has diverted attention away from this woman by doing something so unique, strange in a way. And, you know, theologians, they, they all have different ideas about what Jesus might have been writing. But I, I'm struck by the diversion that Jesus causes so that this woman is no longer the focus of attention. Jesus becomes the focus. He takes all of the scorn. He diverts all of the hatred, right? He even takes the shame, her experience of shame, onto himself at the cross, right? He bears it all for her. I want to talk for a moment about shame because shame will try to convince you that Jesus does not love you, that Jesus can't use you, that what you did is who you are that what you did can, will keep you from this intimate, personal, dynamic relationship with Jesus that I'm talking about. Here's Jesus in all his perfection and his purity. Surely he doesn't want me. He wouldn't be close to me. He couldn't love me. But shame is a lie. And Jesus is the truth. So he speaks truth to this woman and he's speaking truth to you today. Neither do I condemn. Jesus is, is not, has not come to condemn. Yes, he comes to convict of sin, right? He inspires and, and moves our hearts to be transformed and purified, but out of love, not out of shame. He never motivates us with shame. That is the voice of the enemy. That is an experience of how the enemy speaks, not an experience of how the voice of Jesus, who is the truth, speaks. Shame is a lie. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you. Jesus receives you today as you are, and he will. He'll call you to more. He'll purify your heart. He'll purify your past, your memory, your imagination. But that shame that tells you that it can't be done is a lie, and we reject it in Jesus' name. Amen. The woman at the well, John 4. What I want to talk about, what, what Jesus reveals to me about, to us, about personal relationship uh, in John chapter 4 is that Jesus is patient. Even before the woman at the well comes to him, he's there waiting for her. And Jesus is waiting for you. He's waiting to meet you in daily prayer. He's waiting to give you the grace that you need. He's waiting to speak truth where lies have reigned in your mind. He's waiting to love you, to show you his true, deep, real love. He's waiting to change your life. He's waiting for you. And you know what I find so beautiful? Uh, about Jesus waiting at the well, he wasn't waiting for her at the synagogue. He wasn't waiting for her at the church. No, he met her in the everyday activity of her life. He met her at the well. And this is what personal relationship with Jesus does. He becomes uh, so one with us that we don't leave him in that time of prayer in the morning, right? We walk with him throughout our day. He wants to he wants to accomplish all of the daily humdrum, menial tasks of our lives at work, at school. He wants to be on that phone call. He wants to uh, be a part of every relationship. He wants to meet you in your everyday life. And finally, uh, Mary Magdalene in the garden, John chapter 20. Jesus comes to Mary. Yes, she came to the tomb right? Just like you came to this workshop, you came to Youth 2000, you want to meet him, you've shown up, you might even be discouraged or, or nervous, afraid that he won't meet you, but friend, he comes to you just as he came to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, and he called her by name. She didn't even recognize him. Y you have probably encountered the Lord already here, on, through these videos, through these talks, through friends in your daily life, but you just may not yet recognize him. But he calls you by name. He's calling you right now. Close your eyes. 
We invite the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you speak our name? Imagine the voice of Jesus calling you by name. He calls you by name. This invitation isn't for someone else, someone holier, someone further along. This invitation isn't only for priests or religious. This invitation is for you. He's calling you by name. He has spent your whole life whispering your name, calling you by name, speaking your name with love. Would you, would you hear, would you believe today? Not only hear, but listen and believe that Jesus is calling you by name. So you see, in, in relational prayer, we meet the person of Jesus that we see in the Gospels. We meet the Jesus who wants to meet us and encounter us and look at our face and call our name. And not only are we meeting that person, we're, we're meeting the best person, uh, the person who is the most kind, who is perfect in love and purity and holiness. We're, we're meeting the person who is totally attentive to all the inner movements of our soul. He, he totally understands our, our past. He dreams with us, has a vision for our future. This is the person that we meet in prayer. So do you see how when you understand that we're meeting a living person every day in prayer, we're making a shift from something I have to do to someone I want to see. There's an interior shift from obligation to joy. And I wanna just back up <laughs> all of uh, what I'm sharing with you today with a scripture. To me, this is proof positive that God wants dynamic relationship, right? We've proved he's personal, right? We've, we're proving that he's alive. You know that he's alive on planet earth right now in your heart. Uh, by virtue of the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, by, by virtue of the Eucharist, right? The true presence of Jesus. But I want you to understand that it's dynamic, that it's two ways, that he's speaking to you. Even now, John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice. That means that you can hear God's voice. You can hear the Lord speaking to you in the quiet of your heart. Sometimes we, we want, right? We want um, an audible voice. We want lightning bolts or flashing neon sign. We want to hear a voice. But God's voice, God's voice is different, right? God is eternal and perfect and creative. And so the way that he speaks to us will be in a language that we understand. He will speak to you in the language of your heart. He speaks primarily in his word. If you're not reading his word every single day, you're missing a chance to hear God's voice. Every time you Bible, he's speaking to you, you personally. Every single time he has something to say to you. Just simply pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We want ears to not only hear, but to listen. We want faith to believe that this is God's voice speaking to us, right? His word is living and active. That means it matters. It's applicable to you right now. So if you want to hear God's voice, that's the place to start. Start with scripture. If you want more dynamism, right? You want more dialogue in your prayer, go to the word. You can trust the word. You can be sure that God is speaking when you're reading the word. But as I've already shared, God can speak through a song on the radio. He can speak through billboards. He can speak through rainbows, through creation. He can, he can speak through um, friends. He speaks through spiritual reading. We have to open up our minds uh, with faith to believe that God is already speaking to us. You might call that coincidence. You might think it's too silly or too simple, but God speaks to us in a way 
that we understand. Anyone who's ever prayed a St. Therese Novena understands that God speaks through flowers, that God answers prayers through roses. Of course, he's going to use anything and ever to get your attention because he is a passionate, a pursuant lover, lover of your soul. He wants to get your attention. So he's going to speak in a way that you will understand. Um, so I want to I want to give you a place now. I want to give you a place to encounter Jesus, to see his face, to hear his voice, to uh, see his smile, his look of love, right? I want to go back to the garden. It might be uh, the garden in John 20. It might be Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden. But I want to encourage you and invite you now in your holy imagination to picture the garden of your heart or the garden of your soul that so many uh, of the spiritual greats, right, in our Catholic tradition have talked about. I want you to imagine your heart as a garden and that this place would become a trysting place, right, a meeting between uh, two lovers, uh, a meeting place in prayer every day. So close your eyes, if you would, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to sanctify and to use our imagination. God, we know our imagination is a gift from you. We know our imagination uh, can be a mess, Lord, but we invite you now to begin to purify our imagination, to make it holy so that we can see gospel stories, so that we can see your face, so that we can encounter you in the garden and be remade. So I invite you now to imagine your heart as a garden. What does it look like? Are there uh, fruit trees, flowering bushes? Is there a well-worn path? Is it overgrown in some places or is it very well maintained? Are there areas in the garden uh, that are dried out or dead? Is there uh, any land with, with rich soil ready to receive the seed, which is the word of God? What do you notice? A bench, a gazebo, a gate? Feel your feet firmly on the ground and breathe deeply. And now I want you to imagine Jesus is with you in the garden. If it's fuzzy or unclear, if you can only see his feet or his hands, that's okay. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to inspire our imaginations, to help us to see Jesus, to feel Jesus with us. And now ask Jesus to show you around the garden. What does he delight in about the garden of your heart? Where is there new growth? 
where is there good fruit? Allow Jesus to speak words of love and delight and pride over you. There may be areas in the garden that are wild, untouched, or even dying. Places in your heart that you've neglected or that you haven't invited Jesus into. Allow him to show you those places now. And now as you walk with Jesus or sit with Jesus or go back to that special corner or bench or bush or tree that you love in your garden, go back with him and talk to him. The garden will become, I hope, a place where you can continue to encounter the love and the presence of Jesus. You can go back to that image. You can be with him, hear his voice, see his face again. And so as we leave today, uh, my heart breaks to leave you today. I wish I was with you. But as we leave today, I want to uh, ask and, and encourage you to spend just five minutes a day. Five minutes. That's it. You, you're thinking, I could do 10. No, no, no. Do five minutes. Okay, don't bite off more than you can chew, right? Just five minutes with Jesus not praying a rosary, not reading, you know, some, some spiritual reading, not even reading the scriptures. I want you to spend just five minutes relating your heart to God, just talking to Jesus like a friend, because that's how relationships, that's how intimacy is built. Let me pray for you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. For your love. Thank you for always holding out your heart to us and inviting us into relationship with you. I pray that uh, this time in the garden, God would bear much fruit in our hearts. That we would find a place of intimacy and encounter with you in the garden of our hearts. Would you seal this prayer, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit and in your precious blood? Protect it, that we might go back and meet you again and again as you so desire to meet us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Beth, thank you. My heart is on fire. Thank you for your witness. You're just, you're so spirit led and it's such a grace for me to, it's such an honor. It's such a grace, honestly. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I have time, we have time for like one question, if you don't mind. For somebody that's new to you to Thousand, that has never, ever been, this is their <laughs> first online conference this year because unfortunately we can't meet in person. Mm -hmm. And they have, well, you said it in your talk, you know, things don't happen because your granny told you to come here today. Right. It was <laughs> planned and like everything is planned. And even in your, at your testimony, like 
you would have still listened to that Taylor Swift song that morning, but you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have related to what's happening in your life. But that was part of God's plan for you that day to, to hear that. So for yeah. somebody that's totally new, this is their very first encounter. They had, they may have had a personal encounter with Jesus. Jesus may have personally invited them this weekend or a friend because they've seen the joy and the love in that person. They're like, I want what that person has. Mm-hmm. For them to reach the point of a personal intimacy with God or to even start with scriptures, where would they start to even begin to even, if, if maybe they feel like they can't even, for me, sometimes I have to journal because I'm not, I can, I get distracted. So even writing a letter, like, what would you say to somebody that has never, ever had anything before? And this is brand new shampoo for them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, well, I would say to that person, welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm so glad that you're here. And um, yeah, just to, to affirm again that God called you by name because he loves you and he wants you and he chose you and that this life, whatever you think this life is like, however hard or boring you think it might be, it's so much better than you can imagine. Life with Jesus is so rich. It's so fun. It's so full of adventure. I I often tell people, I'm changed. Who I am as a person has changed. My personality has changed, not because there was anything wrong with me before, but because I had so much woundedness and sin in my life that made me feel small and insecure. I I just want to say to you, I want to encourage you and say that life with Jesus will only make your life better. Relationship with Jesus will only make your life uh, more fun and exciting and satisfying. What you're longing for, what you think is out there, it, it pales in comparison to the adventure of life lived with Jesus. So, I know when you first come into faith and you you open yourself up, you're going to be overwhelmed with resources, right? Podcasts, books, do this, pray this way, change your whole life overnight, right? Again, start small. I would say start with five minutes a day and not to, not to quote myself here, but start in the garden. I want you to start by just imagining Jesus. It doesn't have to be a really vivid scene, right? It can just be imagining sitting on a bench next to Jesus and talking to him from your heart, right? That's all it it, it is. That's all prayer really is. I want you to actually begin to have the definition that prayer means relationship. Prayer equals relationship. So I want you to spend time relating your heart to Jesus, just talking to him like a friend. And then if you don't really trust what you're hearing, if you want to get to know Jesus, I would say start with the gospel of Matthew to, to read about the life of Jesus, to kind of um, get a sense of what he's like, um, how he talks, how it feels in relationship. Friend, did I say Matthew? Mm-hmm. I, listen, I meant to say Mark. Maybe someone <laughs> is supposed to read Matthew. I don't know. I always if Matthew's say Mark. calling somebody today, go to Matthew. Apparently, yeah. Maybe the Lord's calling someone named Matthew. I yeah. don't know. But um, yeah, the gospel of Mark is where I typically tell people to start. But you can't go wrong in the gospels. If you want to know what Jesus is like, who is this person? Read the gospels. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you so, so much. Honestly, you are a joy to be around. I love it. Thank you. And Beth, you know what? Please, God, you will be with us in person in 2021. We would love to have you with us. It would be epic and it would be so good that we will, please God, we will meet face to face. But in the meantime, I will see you in the Eucharist. Yes. Yes. And amen. I hope to see you all very soon. I'm praying for you. Thank you so much. God bless. You too. Bye. Bye.